Hello and welcome to the Edgy Futurist podcast. It's great to be with you uh, this evening as we're recording on a on a Thursday night uh, as we we get into the autumn. Um, and yeah, it's uh, it's been it's been a, it's a bit of it. We we're just talking before we went on air about about kind of what we've been up to, and it's all a bit crazy in terms of um, online learning, remote learning, getting schools ready for that. Uh, so yeah, we, I think we're we're coming to you this evening, uh, trying to stay awake. Uh, because of our hectic lives, uh, Steve with his twelve-week-old daughter um, and and my two kids as well, which are which are uh, yeah, which are not sleeping at the moment, which is which is always fun. Uh, so so yeah, we're go- we're going to power through it, and we're going to do that because we're really excited about our guest today. Uh, don't forget that you can subscribe to us on Spotify and on iTunes and anywhere you get your podcasts, Google Podcasts, anywhere. Uh, you can also watch the episodes uh, on YouTube as well. So there are videos on YouTube and you can subscribe to us at youtube.com forward slash edgy futurists. Yeah, in terms of events, don't forget we've got the Google Enterprise for Education events looking at shared experiences and impact. The other week we hosted the leader session, so go check that out on YouTube. Uh, Coming up next week, we have teachers looking at examples, impact, and and experiences of of Google for uh, Enterprise Education. That is 1.30 on the 22nd of October, so next Thursday. Um, On the 26th of November, we have the security panel, and that's at half past one again on a Thursday. Go check it out at enterprise.edgefuturist.com. Yeah, if you're listening to this after those dates, uh, they will be available on the YouTube channel to to go back and watch. So tonight we are delighted to be joined by Liz Pemberton, known on social media and in education circles as the Black Nursery Manager, and she's really active in the EYFS settings. So Liz has worked in early years for over 16 years, but has experience in secondary teaching, in health and social care, childcare and drama. Uh, she's also done university lecturing. She's passionate about many things but will inspire us tonight i think around attitudes to race liz welcome to the podcast thanking you thanking you thanks for having me it's great to have you i'm, I'm really impressed by that that shelf of books behind you uh on top Thank of your, you. your mantelpiece yeah uh, it's all for show nice. i've never read any of them <laughs> but it looks pretty and it's a nice color palette so yeah you know yeah that's really good um <laughs> As you, as you know, this 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 podcast is all about the the future of education, where we mm-hmm. we try to look at the trends of of how education is going to be in the next few years, and and I guess we we talk. There's lots of elements around that. You kind of got the the technology side of things, which we spend a lot of time on, um, but there's there's also kind of the the, the side of things that that you're going to talk about tonight in terms of um, equality and justice within our educational system as well. Uh, can you just give our listeners a, a bit of a background about how you came to to have the, the passion that you have today uh, and, and kind of where that passion is directed? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So I have been working in education now for 16 years and started really looking at equality issues around access to education, access to opportunity, um, access to things socially. Um, I think really before I formally got into education in terms of working in education. So I was always quite observant um, during, I guess, secondary school and college, university, just looking at who was where and why they were there in terms of who got to access um, certain extracurricular activities, who got to access um, certain groups, you know, when they used to put you in different tiers and different sets in secondary school. Um, and I would look at who were in the, who was in the top sets, who was in the middle sets, who was in the bottom sets. Um, and I started to look at that uh, by way of gender, first of all. Um, and then I started looking at things through quite a racialized lens because obviously for people who are watching, they can see that I'm a black woman. Um, But also I went to a school that was a secondary school that was really, really diverse. So had lots of different kids from different racial and ethnic and cultural backgrounds, um, but also a lot of religious backgrounds as well. So I kind of took my friendship group for granted because everybody looked different. But the thing that we had in common was, you know, we probably all lived in the same area or we did the same things after school, you know, so we we're all mates. So at that point, you know, I could have said, oh, I was quite colorblind. You know, I didn't notice everybody was just my friend. Um, and then you start kind of going through life and looking at disparities and looking at why those disparities occur or start asking yourself. So I'd always been interested in people. 
I guess is what I'm saying. Um, and then I was interested in why people were engaged by me. So I've always seen myself as, um, you know, a little bit of a comedian, uh, a little bit of an extrovert, um, never been shy, never been a shrinking war pilot, um, always wanted to have a laugh and always thought about what brought people together. And in my situation, it tended to be personality um, and lots of laughter uh, and lots of, of things that we shouldn't have been doing. So being a little bit of a rule breaker, challenging things, um, but it tended to bring people together in in kind of my early life. So I kind of looked at what could I do that could incorporate me engaging with people, having a laugh, um, being quite inspired and inspiring, but also getting paid for it. <laughs> um, <laughs> Because I was I was a I was a businesswoman from very early, so you know I was always thinking, how do I make money? How do I make money? Um, and I just thought about the fact that teachers used to get a lot of respect. You know, those teachers that got on really well with you seemed to draw the masses with personality, knowledge, humour, and just really being personable. And I always kind of looked at that career and thought that was really interesting. But I also looked at journalism as well, um, and then realised, you know. It was a little bit political. I didn't know where I stood politically when I was like 15. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> I kind of, as I said, went through, looked at my options, went to uni, did a drama degree, um, part and, partnered it with English because I was interested in that as well. Um, and then graduated and had nothing to do with that degree. I was working in H&M in retail. And I was like, I'm too good to clear rail. I'm too good to be standing on the fitting room door. What else can I do? <laughs> you know, so I, I then, just as I said, ventured into thinking about where I could go in terms of drawing on this education interest that I had in our family business was children's day nurseries. So um, my mom had owned children's day nurseries since the late eighties. Uh, and by the time I'd finished um, university, we had three nurseries um, within the family business. Uh, and I kind of went in thinking I could motivate the staff because I thought they needed some motivation because it's quite an undervalued sector. Um, it's a, you know, historically underpaid sector as well. And staff morale generally seems to be quite low um, in that everybody loved looking after the children, but the way in which the sector was kind of looked at and treated by not just wider society, but I think, you know, by the government and, and politically, um, it, it impacted on practitioners, it impacted on earliest practitioners. And I kind of went in and thought, I would like to do something that motivated these people. Uh, fast forward, um, started managing one of the day nurseries, uh, did a master's degree, which looked at people and communities, um, particularly looking at the adult expectations of, of children, um, focused on black children under the age of five and how those expectations shaped you know, later achievements. Um, fast forward again, then went and did um, the graduate teacher program, qualified as a secondary school teacher, because I wanted to see who was coming into the sector. Uh, and that's why I taught health and social care and childcare, and then kind of lent back into that drama because that was you know, what I've studied. But I was really interested in shaping the minds of the people that were coming into the childcare workforce. Um, and I thought, because I'd come straight from industry, I would have a big influence because I was going in there and I was thinking, well, I'm representing myself, but I also know that I'm representative of a particular community as well. Um, and visually, as a teacher going in, uh, I lent myself to a lot of students. I taught in a girls' school, um, a lot of students who could see themselves reflected in me because the school that I worked in was a predominantly black and brown um, school. Um, and by brown, I mean South Asian descent, um, black, black African, black African Caribbean. Um, so that was the, the predominant demographic of the school that I taught in. Did that for a few years and then came back into the um, back into the business uh, and COVID happened. <laughs> and then uh, when COVID happened on the 20th of March, you know, just after 16 years of being in the uh, in the nursery, I was like, right, it's time to change it up again. Lots of things that I'd seen made me think about, you know, what was happening in the world globally in terms of uh, anti-racism and racism, where we were as a society where we were locally. And I thought about the impact for the earlier sector in terms of how many nurseries were gonna be able to operate after COVID 
or during COVID. And I looked at the nursery that, you know, I was managing at the time and just thought, we might not make this, we might not survive it. Um, and when we looked at kind of disproportionately who COVID was impacting, we knew from the statistics, you know, black and brown people were more impacted uh, as a result of COVID. And that happened to be the majority of my staff team. Um, also happened to be the majority of the children and families who attended. And of course, the threat of feeling like, you know, this COVID thing could wipe us out and wipe us out first because of the impact of structural racism and systemic racism, it actually threw a big spanner in the works, but the timing of it actually couldn't have been any better because I was thinking about having a little bit of a career change and thinking about going into, again, seeing who was coming into the childcare market, but looking at how equipped that market was when it came to talking about racism and talking about anti-racist practice, because I've noticed there'd always been statistics for secondary, talking about you know the underachievement of black African Caribbean boys, uh, information about um, white working class boys, information uh, and statistics about you know engaging with hard to reach families and what did hard to reach mean? Um, you know what did inner city school mean? You know what were all these things code for? And I just thought I was really interested in actually going in and working with people who primarily would be going into the early year sector and thinking about challenging some notions that we might have about communities that, you know, are perceived to be quote unquote hard to reach um, and who those communities were and what those communities looks like where I am, um, which is in Birmingham, if people can't tell by my brummy 0121 <laughs> accent, um, you know, what they look like and the locality of where the nursery was, you know, we were sat straddling two very different locations so the most one of the most affluent areas in in Birmingham called Edge Baston um, and one of the most deprived areas in Birmingham called Ladywood and the nursery straddled in terms of where it was located the two the two areas so it was like a tale of two cities but it meant that it really impacted the children that kind of came to the nursery and I kind of started looking, as I said, at that um, and thinking about what we would do as a setting to make sure that we were culturally compatible, um, that we made sure that children and families that came felt like it was a home from home kind of experience um, and made sure that we really celebrated the importance of having a positive sense of a racial identity in a world which we were growing to see was becoming more and more hostile. You looked at now the political climate of the quote unquote hostile environment that was being created by our fantastic government. Um, we looked at how that was impacted again on particular communities, the Windrush scandal, um, all of these things that were happening were just culminating in my mind to think, God, you know, when my granddad came here, you know, from Jamaica in 1954, he would tell me things, he would tell me stories, and it was all starting to make absolute sense. You know, you'd see flickers of things and you'd hear things and you'd read things, because obviously we can't escape the media. Um, but when you see how it impacts on the ground, you start thinking, ah, oh, okay, Britain, okay, England, this is interesting, because I feel as British, um, you know, and as English as both of you, Dan and Steve, but for some reason, the world's not responding to me in the way that I thought that it would. Um, as I said, I, I've got this accent. I was born here. Um, I've got a passport that's the same colour as somebody who's, you know, British citizen. But the world was continuing to react and respond in a particular way, which I was like, hmm, I understand now what a hostile environment is. And I think when the Windrush scandal happened, it just made me think even more so. Yeah. I think some could, could you, Liz, could, had. I, could you... Could you maybe go into a bit about you know when you say that the world wasn't reacting, um, yeah, kind of as you ex as you may have expected or as you've seen it reacting for other people? Could you maybe go into a bit more detail about that so we can understand? Totally, that? yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I think when we use the term British, you know, or, or English, there are um, lots of images I think conjured by lots of different kinds of people um, in terms of what that looks like. So it's the same way that I know. When I was managing the nursery, um, my maiden name is Kerr. It's a, it's a Scottish name. My, you know, Christian name is Elizabeth. 
so when people would see my name written down, they didn't expect to see me if they came to the nursery. They expected to see a white woman because my name was Elizabeth Kerr. And there are lots of assumptions that are made from people's names, of course. But one of those assumptions is about the colour of your skin um, and what is uh, assumed to be a quote unquote, you know, English name and what's assumed to be a quote unquote ethnic name. So I was able to see visibly how people might respond when I was in different social situations. For instance, you know, somebody had inquired about a nursery space. Um, and this is, you know, before we had a nursery website where you'd see all the pictures of staff and myself. People would just telephone, make an inquiry, um, and then it'd come along. And more often than not, if it was a white family that had come to look around, there was sometimes this, this visible look of a little bit of shock that they would try to mask. Um, and, you know, you, you would feel that there was a bit of, oh, OK, well, who were they expecting to see? And the first few times you're like, nah, it's nothing to do with the colour of my skin. You know what I mean? Like, I've never uh, thought in a way I would be discriminated against, you know, because somebody would come to a nursery and surely they'd just send their child here because it's a great nursery. You know, at the time, Ofsted had graded us, you know, good, um, you know, with outstanding features. So people were just like, yeah, and it would happen. And you'd think, oh, OK, that person decided not to send their child here. No problem. Um, you know, the next white family would come along and it would be a similar reaction and the next white family would come along and it would be, and it kind of kept on happening. And I started thinking, this, this can't be to do with the quality of provision. <laughs> it it no. can't be this, this must be something else. But you, you deny it to yourself, you deny it to yourself until you start thinking, hmm, okay, this could be that thing. So when I talk about the world reacting, of course, that's just the microcosm, that's my experience. Um, it's not to say that, everybody's had the same experience. I can only speak to mine. Yeah. Uh, but when you kind of cooperate those kinds of tales um, amongst your own peer groups with other people that look like you, other people who are black women, black men, black people, you tend to see there's this common thread and everybody's telling you or saying the same story and it's almost like a given, like, oh yeah, well, probably they came and they just saw that everybody was black. So they just thought, nah, it's not, it's not the nursery for them. Yeah. So. I think we, I really want to bring it around to education eventually, but I think it'd be great to spend a bit of time on this. I think because I like, I, I think probably like many other people around around the time of what was going on during lockdown with with the protests um, and Trafalgar Square and all of that and that hostility that you mentioned, a lot of stories started to emerge um, in terms of and and kind of resonating with exactly what you were saying there like i i, I heard a story recently about a, a a black solicitor who every time they went to the courthouse they were told they were going there was they were going in the wrong direction because the person on the door thought they were there as a um as a criminal um mm -hmm. hearing stories of uh, similar stories to that which which for me um like i'm from a I'm from a very sheltered place. I'm from the northeast of England. That isn't the most diverse diverse place in the world. Um, it really isn't. Um, so, like, I think every every time I I hear this story, I have a conversation um, uh, about this. Like that we're having now is a massive learning curve for me every, every mm -hmm. time. Um, and I think that's why I kind of love having these conversations because because I learn so much um, mm -hmm. about it about myself and about. About I guess about how to how to how to then go about and and kind of make make our society a better place I guess and mm -hmm. or, or just or just in the the arenas that that I work in or, or live in, but it'd be, it'd be great to talk about you know the those reactions that you got from people. How, what 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 your take on kind of where that comes from in terms of because I'm I'm guessing and and I, and I could I could be completely wrong here. Um, but I'm guessing these people aren't overtly racist people. Um, mm. So where where does where does where does this kind of under undertones of racism come from? And is do you think it's a it's a it's societal wide, or do you think it's do you think it's just down to certain people from certain certain upbringings? Or yeah, it just it'd be great to get get your take on mm. that because I think that's probably like one of one of the first steps in order to be able to to have a bit of self reflection, isn't it? And, and thinking yeah. where where is this coming from? 
Yeah, totally. Because we're all born with internal bias and internal prejudice and internal, internal you know, stereotyping. We, we all do that. You know, we make assumptions based on our experiences of life. But also we can't ignore the fact that a lot of things influence our perceptions of people, um, mainly the media, you know, and our own, as I said, individualised experiences with different kinds of people. Um, and also we are by nature drawn to people perhaps who look like us because we want to go where we feel comfortable. Nobody wants to feel uncomfortable and people associate, you know, discomfort sometimes with being around people that don't look like them or share their same values or an assumption of, you know, just likes, interests. It's, it's, it's like compatibility, isn't it? If you meet somebody and they don't have the same interests as you, you know, and you don't have anything in common, it's not going to make for a great relationship. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes, you know, you're going to go towards somebody who's got a shared interest. And I think some of those things are layered in, you know, cultural um, similarities. Uh, but I think when you think about, you know, saying, are these people overtly, you know, they're not, they're not always overtly racist. I think when we're looking at terms and definitions of what racism is, I think we have to look at impact before we look at, you know, whether we think somebody is overtly um, or covertly racist, the impact is still the same. And I think the impact is what we have to really examine first. What is the impact of people who are on the receiving end of racism, whether it be covert um, or whether it be overt? Because I always talk about this in terms of like intention. You know, somebody saying, oh, I wasn't intentionally racist or I didn't mean it like that. But if somebody spills coffee on you, whether it's accidental or whether it's on purpose, it's still going to burn you, isn't it? <laughs> you know, you're still going to feel the impacts of that. And I liken it to that because it just helps to solidify things in people's minds. Too often we're thinking about the perpetrators, um, you know, of, of racist behaviours. Uh, and we're not thinking about the victims, people who are on the receiving end, if you like. And we would never look at it like that for any other kind of case. If you look at, say, sexual abuse, you know, we are moving out of a place and a space of victim blaming. You know, we're not going to blame the victim, we're not going to blame the woman for being raped. You know, we're going to the rapist. If we're thinking about cases of sexism, you know, we're not going to say, when we talk about men, nobody's going to jump up and say, yeah, but not all men. Because the assumption is, yeah, obviously we're not talking about all men. We're just saying, oh, you know, when that man did that, oh, what are men like? Why are men like that? You know, it's, it's it doesn't happen, you know, that the case is that men would jump up and say, you know, not all of us are like that. Um, because as I said, it's a shared understanding. We know we're talking about some. So I think what's happening is that people are getting their backs up around conversations about racism, particularly when you use the word white and you put that word white before something else. So if you say white fragility, there's a reaction. If you say, you know, white supremacy, there's a reaction because the connotation for white supremacy is the KKK. You start thinking about people with, you know, white masks, white hats on. <laughs> um, even if you just use the word white in terms of defining somebody by their, you know, the way they're racialized, there's a reaction. And it's so interesting because I knew at a very early age that I was black. Um, and so there's a process there of, of othering. And it wasn't necessarily that I was told by my family, remember, you're black, remember, you're black. The world told me I was black. You know, my interactions at primary school or pro before that, you know, would have said to me, I, I am, I'm black. Um, and I think about how early we come to kind of get this knowledge about how we're racialized or who racializes us. And I think so often when we look at kind of the current social constructs around race, when are white people racialized as white or are white people seen as the default? You know, that's just the standard and then everybody else is othered. So then we get terms uh, coined like BAME. So BAME's just everybody else. There's white and then there's the BAME community. Well, what's the BAME community? <laughs> you know, that doesn't encapsulate me, BAME. You know, there are so many different kinds of racial groups, but we move to this space of kind of using language that continues to other people who are non-white. So... Uh, you know, I go back to your original question about, you know, do you think that people are being overtly racist? People can't hide their response to things. It's not about, you know, that. I think it's just about, as I said, the impact that that has on for people who are on the receiving end of those reactions. Yeah, I think that's so powerful. Uh, the fact, just like what you said, the impact's the same. Like that, I think that's such a powerful statement. And I think a lot, a lot of people don't realise that. And, and, and I think, 
you hear, I'm, you hear, th- you hear people say like, you know, because I'm, I'm, I like to watch pol- political TV programs. I like to listen to political radio shows. Like, I'm very kind of just it, it really interests me. So I, I when, when when kind of those protests were going on, you you hear like people from both sides kind of, um, and and you, you you hear things like, well, well, we're not we're not over, we're not overtly racist. This is not we don't have to change society because when when we're not racist, um, but the fact that like you say that that the the impact is the same whether it whether it is covertly or, or overtly um whether it whether we even realize we're doing it um and i think that's probably that's probably the area that that needs to because that needs to be addressed the most because i think the the kind of the that stereotypical image of the 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 middle-aged man with the bald head and Trafalgar square screaming in the face of of the protester from the the other side that it, it's a minority and and i guess the the majority is is where we we, we don't realize our, our bias um but th- but then to bring that statement back in the impact is still the same that's so powerful because it it almost it almost makes the point that well it does make the point that um it's no it's no less worse mm-hmm. and it's and and therefore that brings us to the next stage of so it needs to be addressed yeah, um, yeah, yeah. It can't, it can't, we can't just say, "Well, I didn't mean it." Um, sorry, yeah. but I, I, like, I didn't, I didn't mean it. I'm, there's no malice in it. Like, you can't blame me because there's no malice. Like, that's not enough anymore, is it? I mean, well, it, it takes away the accountability, doesn't it? If somebody says, you know, I'm on the receiving end of your racism, and then I confront you or have a conversation, and you say, "I don't mean it," that takes away the accountability, it derails the conversation. It makes me feel embarrassed for even addressing it in the first place. And eventually, if that happens enough throughout your life, you then start thinking, "I'm just not going to challenge it." And then the wider, you know, impacts that you see how the media responds, you see how society responds. Albeit, yes, sometimes things like social media can be an echo chamber, and of course algorithms and the way in which things work we know why we see what we see but when we see this national response to diversity performing a a, 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 a performance dance performance which alludes to the black lives matter um process and then you see this microcosm of a response which then you in your own mind start thinking god is this britain is this british society but then you have statistics about systemic racism and you know the metropolitan police and you think about the 1999 mcpherson report and how institutions are are you know are racist and then you start thinking well god is is this britain and then you hear about another situation where somebody's driving down the road and they happen to be a black man and the police have stopped them and they've searched them and you know so all of these things are continuing to reinforce what you have always suspected might be happening but your white mate said, oh, I didn't mean it. It wasn't anything like that. You know, you're taking it too personally. So you start to think about how you're constructing the world and the lens through which you see the world could be very different to how somebody else who is not the same race, not the same culture as you sees the world. I didn't know what it was like to be on the receiving end of the introduction of the prevents duty, you know, in policy, because I'm not a Muslim woman. If I was a Muslim woman and I was part of that community, Islamophobia would have absolutely impacted me horrifically because we could not deny the impact of Islamophobia and the, I guess, the influence of things like the prevent duty, which seems to focus on a particular group of people. But I know certainly when, for instance, I had the prevent duty at the nursery and we were told we had to enforce it, the people that I was most fearful of were actually white supremacist far right groups because I would have emails to the nursery that said, you know, why is your nursery full of monkeys? You know, so the threat to me wasn't actually, you know, the radicalization radicalization of, you know, people who were, you know, brown. <laughs> it was about the radicalization of actually people that were white um, and were aligned with, as I said, far right groups. So when we think about the lens through which we see things, it's really important to have that uh, cemented, I guess, in your in your mind, because it depends what end of the the scale you kind of looking at. Yeah, and and I'm really conscious in terms of we talked about before we came on, and and you said, oh, uh, somebody in senior leadership, and I just clarified that I'm 100 percent nowhere near it, <laughs> um, and and I and I do look after a team, and I'm I'm proud to do so, but that whole conversation of how do we then ensure that we 
as leaders, but also all of the leaders that we ensure that actually that the that the, the leadership in regards of what industry you're in and obviously we're in education really represents the demographic of the people that we are leading that we're trying to mold in terms of future leaders in terms of teachers but also then even really drilling it down in terms of i know that in terms of our organization have been looking at this in regards to our recruitment process and how we is our demographic in terms of our teachers and that everybody in our roles are we really doing enough and we 100 percent are not doing enough in regards to representation of the demographic that we are trying to educate, that we have a high percentage of, of learners um, that come from particular backgrounds and, and religions and everything else. And actually, I think across the whole education sector, we are not doing enough. Firstly, in terms of teachers, in terms of the education of, of, of the students we're, we're trying to educate, but also then all the way up to education, we, we are 60% in terms of our um, senior leadership and executive leadership female, but actually, the conversation is well beyond that because it's it, there is nobody. Um, I know you said it in terms of black or brown on our executive leadership team. So actually, how do we ch how do we change it? We need to change it. That conversation is something definitely that I'm really interested in from yeah. somebody who is in leadership. And I'll say mm -hmm. in leadership. That's <laughs> why Dan said balding. I'm starting to go bald because <laughs> and everything else. But I understand that actually I have, I have a role to play in terms of because I now lead a, a team that leads a team. And actually, I've just gone through a complete change in my team and I have been conscious to ensure that actually we are making sure that in terms of the people that are interviewing other individuals is diverse, the type of questions where we actually advertise is thought about because it's all right saying, well, we always use those. Yeah, but who reads the, that kind of so I know I'm I'm trying to translate and I'm waffling and everything else, but actually I really want to start to, to in terms of your thoughts around that process because yeah. that's a big issue as well in terms of education and beyond. It really is, and I always say, you know, Steve, the thing is, it's by design. Okay, so when we're looking at you know systemic racism, that has not happened by accident. It is absolutely by design. It is not a coincidence that top tier you know, senior leadership that there's such a small percentage of head teachers in this country that are, are black, um, for instance, that is by design. Because when you look at how, you know, systemic racism works, it's about policies and procedures, it's about things that have been put in place to, sh to stop certain people getting past a particular glass ceiling, if you like. So we could have all the determination and all the will in the world, you know, but there's going to, this is going to get to a decision maker who actually just wants to see people that look like them. That That's what's going to happen. So it's kind of, if we look at, you know, and I take it out of education to bring it back into education, because we have to use these examples of wider society to help contextualize what's happening within education. If we look at what's happening with Lewis Hamilton at the moment, that is a perfect example. Okay. This guy has overproved himself. He is, you know, the best. <laughs> Look at what's happening in wider society. Look at how he's being responded to. And I think this is a really good example to look at, you know, yeah, senior leadership is very important. People who make the decisions are very important as long as you don't talk about race. Don't talk about that. We can talk about gender, absolutely. But look how long it's taken for that conversation to come through, even when we think about women's rights. And then we think about which women's rights, because the suffragettes didn't represent me as a black woman. The suffragettes movement was about white women, <laughs> you know. So when we look at the rights of women, which women? When we think about the conversation around race and leadership and senior leadership and who's making what decisions, it is important to have these conversations, but fear stops these conversations from happening. And that could be fear of saying the wrong thing. It could be fear of um, offending somebody. It could be fear because there's no relationships in your own life outside of work which are really rooted in uh, deep respect, a liking of somebody who's different to you, who's got a different racial you know, background to you, different ethnicity. And that's why I say it's so important to think about who you are outside of the education space before you come in, because that will inform your practice. It will inform your leadership. It will inform your interview style. It will inform everything. You can't put on a mask when you come into the role. You are who you are, you know, and that starts from much earlier on before you've 
qualified as a teacher or before you've been put in a, in a leadership position. And sometimes you, you know, sometimes that that is the biggest the biggest barrier, just actually accepting we're not doing as well as we should be doing here in this department. Sometimes it's about accepting, oh, you know, we're always here and we're telling the kids, you know, don't do that, don't do that, reflect on your behaviour, have a think about it, come back. But how often are we reflecting on our behaviour? We're educating the future and we're talking about a future that we want to create. But how often are we spending reflecting on our own practices? How often are we reflecting on how we are upholding um, a system which inhabits certain people from getting past a certain point? How often are you sitting down and thinking, you know what, there's nobody on the senior, lead senior leadership that looks like Liz. In fact, I've never been ever managed by a black woman. In fact, I've never been in a school where there's been a black head. <laughs> you know, how often are people having those kinds of reflections and those conversations? And even if they are, how much has it mattered that they would want to make the difference? You're right. Definitely. And 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 I will, we'll go back to that. But one thing that really I'm a PE teacher originally in terms of my training. And one thing you said in regards to Lewis Hamilton, and I want to just is, is around Raheem Sterling. And I remember I can't even I don't know if it was year, I think it was a couple of years ago in terms of the behaviour in the media, but also society towards Raheem Sterling. And he did and, and he did a, a lot of work around that whole connotation of the language the media uses towards him and how that compared to other people that weren't performing and, and missing goals and everything else and, and that behaviour. But also, the, the language of, of, of young, young black, uh, the, the representation in the media of young black footballers and actually the, the, the slight variation in language that, although at times subtle, was actually when you really start to unpick it, and I, and I, and I did, it was startling where you're thinking, and I think he compared... Um, some people who just got signed their first contract, and I can't remember who he said it. It's like this person's gone out and 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 oh my god, look how amazing they are because they've bought their mum and dad a house. And then the same, exactly the same story was, look at this flash um, individual and look at all. Oh, he thinks he's made it and he's spending all his money. And I was like, as an individual, I never noticed it, but actually after that, I noticed it every time because you're thinking. How on earth was I blinkered to actually? I was, and I was blinkered by it. And I don't read the paper all the time, but I was blinkered by it, and I'd not seen it. And I was like, "Oh my god, this is so bad that actually, this is the message we're putting out." And also, if you want to make it and you want to do something and you want to do something well, potentially it's not worth it, especially if you're a young black man, because or a black woman. I know there's other, and we'll get onto you know, the Olympians and, the, and and potentially the racial profiling that's come out this week and, and recent weeks as well, but what raise aspirations because you'll then be absolutely belittled and you'll be absolutely hammered down. Well, not be funny, but what message does that send? Totally. Do, do well and you'll get hammered. Absolutely. And these are conversations that have to be had and they're considerations that have to be made. But the considerations that I've always made as a black woman, whenever I'm walking into any space, I know that the reaction to anything that I say about race, particularly within an education space, is going to be absolutely hammered, whether that be on social media, on Twitter, particularly on Twitter, because it's a hellhole. But, you know, on Twitter, anywhere that I go and speak about this, the reaction to me is, I know she's going to be banging on about race again. Oh, here we go, talking about the black-white thing. You're racist for actually talking about racism. You know, we have this absolute illogical approach whereby it is that, and it's a consideration that I always have to make. But I decide I'm going to do this and put my best foot forward and do what I need to do, because actually in me speaking about it, it's empowering for a lot of other people who might not have felt like they could say what I am saying they felt like they couldn't call out, you know, I'm calling out a whole sector. I'm calling out the whole of the early year sector. Because I'm like, hold on, why are we in a space in 2020 when we're having all white panels, when we're talking about specialising in play or talking about early language development or talking about, you know, neuroscience? Why are we having online panels where everybody's white? That's not the sector. You know, what what's happening? I'm calling out, you know, Ofsted, I'm talking about, why is the whole governing top tier of Ofsted white? And why historic, historically has it kind of always tended to be like that? Why? And I'm asking those questions out loud on my social media platforms, knowing that the risk of that is that somebody's going to say, how dare you? 
don't talk about this. Why are you talking about it? And so when you do these things, it is, you're always putting yourself in that space and place. And then you're told you've got a chip on your shoulder. That's what footballers are told. You're making it always about race. It's not that important. We're sick of this now. And then it becomes this thing where you are almost forced to or bullied into wanting to perhaps just stop talking about it. I mean, that will never be me. But um, of course it happens. Yeah, there is that. It is that myth, isn't it? That let's not. Well, if we don't talk about it, if we don't acknowledge it, then then it'll just go away. Right? Racism will just it'll just go away. And then if we all and I'm just um, uh, I read your your article on intersectionality on on uh, on Medium dot com, and when you you talk about how you kind of talk about that exact point and how the like, kind of that's not enough, and how uh, especially in your your nurseries talking. About, you kind of take the attitude of being anti-discriminatory and not just let's just not talk. When like, <laughs> yeah, it's just it's crazy, really. Like just just to, just to think, oh well, we'll not talk about racism, so it, it won't happen. Mm. Um, it's a think, very British thing, though. Yeah, and I'm just and actually as I'm as I'm talking, I'm thinking that that attitude has caused so much havoc in in other circumstances as well. Um, look at um, institutional paedophilia in the BBC. Absolutely. Let's just not talk about it. Let's. It'll, it's not happening if we don't talk about it in the in in church circles as well. Um, let's not talk about it because you, well, and then you get the mix the mixture of the hierarchy and the, and the power games that 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 are at play in that as well. And yeah, but like you say in that article, it's it's about being anti discriminatory. It's not just it's not just saying well. Well, let's not let's let's make an effort not to discriminate. But actually, it's gone the other way and saying, no, let let's actually like you like you just said uh, so eloquently about let's actually no, let's call this out. Let's call this out at every opportunity. Um, it'd be great to get into how you do that with with the the nursery kids as well, and how yeah. you kind of how you think we how do you think? Um, and I guess us, Steve, um, having a young daughter, I've got um, uh, two kids that are that are uh, one's one year old and the other. Uh, my boy's um five weeks old now so it'd be i think just i think probably and i'm probably I, i'm probably speaking on behalf of steve here as well just how how do you kind of how do you bring your kids up how do you be a teacher of of those um young kids and and instill those values in them allow them to be able to to speak up and it'd be, it'd just be great to hear from you on on that totally i think what we have to do at the first instant is debunk this myth about kindness stop saying that if you bring up your children to be kind and nice they won't be racist <laughs> or because you're kind and nice you're not racist there's this thing and this whole rhetoric around kindness and niceness with children and then that will just eliminate it all we've done it because our children are kind um but a really you know kind boy has called me the n-word you know a really nice boy um has said derogatory things about you know my family you know the school thought he was a kind nice young boy and I remember at that time in primary school my mum and dad go into the school and that was what they were told he's a kind boy he's a nice boy <laughs> but I was saying well no actually he said this to me and I know that this is wrong so I think when we're talking about anti-racist practice in the early years and what we must do is not shy away from those conversations early on children are inquisitive by nature they will ask you mommy daddy how comes that person's hair's like that or how comes that person's face is like that that's what children do they're inquisitive and instead of actually being embarrassed or scared or shy or like oh god no why they said that answering the question talking about the fact that a child's going to probably ask you, why is that person's skin colour like that and my skin colour is like this? Talking about it, why that happens and why it is the case. And then you can introduce some kindness. Then you can introduce a narrative about being nice. Then you can introduce a narrative about the fact that actually we're all really different, but we all must treat each other very nicely. Some of us have got brown skin. Some of us have got pink skin because children are very literal, aren't they? They're not going to say you're black, I'm white. <laughs> you know, they're looking at things very literally. I think when we're thinking about children 
looking at themselves um, and, you know, doing things around recreating what they may look like. It's an activity that's always happening in primary, in reception, in early years. You've got all these crayons, you know, but is there a crayon that reflects my colour skin? For asking a child to do a self-portrait or drawing mommy and daddy and me and the dog and whoever, you know, are we giving children that choice so that they have an opportunity to pause and think, oh, actually, my skin looks like this crayon and my friend's skin looks like that crayon. It's such a simple thing, but as practitioners, as parents, are we giving children that choice? Also, I think as parents, when we're thinking about social activities and engaging children with things that are happening outside of school, what does their friends group look like? Yes, granted, you might live in an area where everybody's white. <clears throat> However, people do tend to travel. People too tend to go outside of the city that they live in. You know, what are the conversations that are had? Where are friendships being forged? Everybody remembers making a friend on their first family holiday, you know, and most likely that holiday was where people didn't look like them. So are we encouraging our children to make friends with people who don't look like them? Are we encouraging those relationships to be formed organically as well, not forcing them because, all oh, right, there's a black kid over there, <laughs> go and be friends with them. <laughs> you know, are we encouraging conversations to happen whereby we're saying to children, nothing that would be discriminatory, nothing that would be racist, nothing that could be misconstrued. Are we consciously aware of our facial expressions when we're talking about other cultures, when we're speaking about other cuisine? If we're going to have a Chinese on the Friday, are we saying something about Chinese community, something about, you know, the East Southeast Asian community, that's derogatory? I often think about that in light of, you know, what's happening with COVID and coronavirus and the rise in racist attacks towards you know the, the southeast and east asian community it's disgusting it's saddening but we know britain you know we love the chinese we love the indian and we refer to those things you know food as you know <laughs> the the group of people we we, we say commonly if we're going to go get chinese we're talking about food and it's a common understanding but you know how do we then relate that to how the community has been feeling in the rise of this we see how you know the man with the orange face that I will not name speaks about these communities um, across the pond. And we have to be able to think about what children are receiving and decoding from these messages that they're given. Um, so I just think we have to make sure that, of course, resources are there and they're reflective of lots of different kinds of people. Yes, have your black doll. Yes, have storybooks that have lots of different kinds of children in them. But also talk about those things in the resources. Talk about if you've got, you know, if you've bought a doll, are you going in and automatically buying the white doll for your white daughter? It doesn't mean that you can't buy a black doll. You can, <laughs> you know, and these are really early starters. They're conversations that you can have, but they're, I guess, actions that you can take um, without thinking, oh, OK, right, this is going to be difficult. This is going to be awkward. Because um, I think there has to be some level of preparation if we really want to think about the future generation. Yeah, definitely. And what what uh, in your nursery do you, is a uh, do you have a diverse um, diverse group of children in the nursery and and how, and kind of I guess the question is how do you, is that what you do? Do you actively kind of yeah sit down with and, them and, and let each other let them learn about each other and things like that? Just be it'd be great to because I'm just I'm aware that we're, we're talking on a head level a lot. It'd be great to get some like personal. Like yeah. examples of, of that happening and totally yeah. so in my old life when I was a nursery manager because you know I've left that life behind <laughs> but <laughs> when I was and we think about what was happening on the ground the demographic of the children that attended my nursery were predominantly black and brown and they would often talk about the shades of their blackness or the shades of their brownness um, and they would always have conversations about the crayons that matched them that was always a very interesting conversation. And at any one time, you know, we'd have two or three white children um, that were in the nursery, but never more than that. It was really interesting. So the white children were always the minority in my nursery and the black and brown children were the majority. And the conversations that were had, we had a little girl who attended and she had red hair. And, you know, the children would talk to her about her red hair and ask her, why is your hair red and why is my hair black? And that you just hear them in conversation, you know, at three years old, talking about these differences, but not differences that would separate them, differences that would bring them together because then they'd want to touch each other's hair. 
But then as they move on through life, you know, you teach them code, you don't go around and just touch people's hair. <laughs> but at three years old, that's what they did. And they would compare themselves and look at themselves, but in a way which was supported, I guess, and encouraged by the adults that were around them, the practitioners and myself, you know. So it was really interesting to kind of see how we wouldn't shy away from the conversations about racial difference because hair is you know it's a different skin color and shade and tone is a difference um within my staff team you know i had staff members that uh covered their head and wore hijabs because they were muslim and so the children would ask you know what's underneath your scarf have you got hair underneath there not shying away from that talking about the reasons why you know and bringing that conversation about religion and culture right into the setting because you know if somebody was to react to that by as I said before, being fearful or being embarrassed or being scared, what learning's taking place then for, for the children? Yeah. I, I think that's really interesting. I think it's that whole thing of actively changing your viewpoint and thinking about, right, we're, we're, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna influence and we're going we're gonna to do this as a collective and we're really going to think about what we are trying to achieve the whole reason why we're trying to do it and the impact of potentially that will have on the future generation. And I think early years seem to get so much right. Don't they? Do you know, do you know, do you know in terms of that, the learning education, we're not going to go into all of that, <laughs> but actually they seem to get so much right. And also actually, is that, that's not just that in terms of loads of different ways of delivery and learning yeah. and, play and all that kind of thing. And then it just seems that we could change just early years, but actually there's a whole education system that, that needs to change beyond that and 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 i was going to ask a question about rebel rebel ideas you know a diverse thinking and, and that book that i've read and 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 the whole how does that influence and how can people use that as a kind of right these are the examples of this is what happens if you don't do it <laughs> yeah this is the example of literally if you get it wrong and if you are so naive to it this is potentially what you are doing and this is the impact it will have because some of those examples are startling. If anybody hasn't read it, go go read that. Mm. I, 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 it was a really powerful book for me. But I suppose it, it does lead into kind of my, my, my whole thinking of what neck, what do what and what is your best advice for for regardless of who we are, what do we need to do right now? Because it needs to change and it needs mm. active people from whatever background, ethnicity and everything to make that change, yeah. to, to not yeah. shake away. But what is your advice for regardless, based on the work that you are doing? We have to start getting used to being in uncomfortable situations and in the midst of conversations, saying out loud, you know what, I got that wrong. I got that wrong and I'm going to actively get that right or work towards getting it better. Right now, we have to just have conversations across race, across culture, across religion. We have to start talking to one another and stop allowing ourselves to stay in an echo chamber where everybody looks the same, everybody has the same views, everybody has the same thoughts. And also, I think what has to happen in this kind of conversation is white people have to get used to listening. White people have to get used to listening. If somebody is calling them out on racism, remember there's lots of forms of discrimination, but if we're thinking about racism, we have to stop thinking that there's a right and a wrong or there's two sides. You know, racism is not up for debate. There isn't a right and a wrong. We talked about paedophilia within the BBC. Nobody was saying, oh, you know, yeah, but Jimmy Savile, mm, you know, we could have let him off. He was a nice guy. He did Jim will fix it. Nobody said that. They were like, yeah, this is not it. This is not on. He's cancelled. The end. And I think the same kind of narrative has to be pushed towards when we're having conversations about racism. It has to truly be a zero tolerance approach, a, a true zero tolerance approach. And that will only happen when conversations are had transparently like this and in the open for everybody to kind of listen to. Because there's a transparency where it can be, you know, your own friends group, your own family group. There's that level of transparency. But transparency like this on a level where strangers are going to be listening. And some people might have turned up in the first three minutes when they heard that I was the black nursery manager on social media, because often there is this reaction to conversations about race, which are really visceral. Um, and 
it's really hard for me to comprehend that. I don't understand why somebody wouldn't just want to have the conversation and listen. If somebody's on the receiving end of racism, they are the victims of racist abuse. Wouldn't the default thing be to be able to talk about that and to be listened to? And so when I speak about, you know, white people listening to black and non-black people of colour about experiences, that is a key tool, the tool of listening and actively listening as well to want to bring about change because black people, non-black people of colour, they can't do it on their own. As you said, it's a collective effort. You know, this is where the conversation about allyship comes in. You know, it's a collective effort. It requires everybody to do it. We see it in football, we see it in sport. It requires a joint effort. It's no point the black footballers making up a fuss if the white footballers are going to be like, no, nah, well, this doesn't really impact us. We see allyship, we see a team sport, we're seeing on Sky Sports, and I can't avoid it because my husband has it on 24 seven. But every time I see it, you know, everybody's got a Black Lives Matter badge on. And I'm like, oh gosh, this is interesting. And he's like, yeah, yeah, they're all on it. You know, it's that collective thing. Because when we think about, I guess, Black Lives Matter, being politicized and we're being fed this narrative about it being political it isn't it's about humanity and we've moved away from that for some reason because the word black's in it you know it's about humanity these are human issues and we have to move back to having conversations where we see one another as equally entitled to having a quality of life which is not a quality of life that's dependent on you know the color of our skin that's why we have to talk about it now so that for future generations, you know, we are moving somewhere towards the direction of this being a much better, nicer place and space. Yeah, I think you know, that whole idea of getting it out of the political realm um, is so important, especially in we're, we're in a time of of political polemics where where we this we've got two extremes at the moment. Uh, we're in a crazy time of politics. Um, we're in to for someone just to associate um race within the political arena it's very easy then to just dismiss it isn't it if you're not on the what's perceived the right side of the the political fence for that then it's very easy to dismiss it liz um it's been amazing uh chatting to you i've seriously enjoyed it um and, and learned and learned a lot what what's next for you in in terms of what 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 you working on? And if people want to hear more from you as well, where where can they yeah, encounter I your work? I am always gassing on podcasts, talking to great people like yourself. Um, I'm writing articles. So I've just written something for Tapestry um, Foundation Stage Forum about how to talk to children about race. Um, I am thinking about how I can get this conversation about anti-racist practice in the early years further and wider. So I set up the company in July, um, the Black Nursery Manager Training and Consultancy, which is taking the anti-racist conversation um, in early years to local authorities. So I'm doing some work with lots of local authorities up and down the country. I am doing training sessions um, off my own Instagram platform and putting on webinars. So, you know, people can find me on Instagram at the Black Nursery Manager, which is where I'm the most active because I put up a variety of different medias videos, posts, um, links to things. Uh, and also, you know, in a more kind of activist state, I'm really just encouraging people to have conversations like this. I've started doing a little mini series of the Black Nation Manager Talks to White People in the early years where I do an Instagram live every week, every Wednesday, where I speak to somebody white in the early year sector, similar to what we've done today, just about what we think is happening, what needs to happen, um, and where we can push this thing uh, forward. Um, so yeah, I can be found on Instagram, the Black Nation Manager, on Twitter, Liz Betty Pem, um, on LinkedIn, you know, the professional side of me, uh, <laughs> um, at Liz Pemberton. Um, but yeah, I would really urge people, even if they don't have an Instagram account, set one up just to follow me, please, because it's, um, it's worth your while. Yeah, as as Dan said, absolute pleasure. Um, it's been a, a real education for me. I've really enjoyed it, um, and it's one of those podcasts that I'm, I'm immersed in, where I sit there and, and I think for maybe for the first twenty five minutes, I'm conscious. I'm thinking I haven't even said anything because I was just literally listening. I really was listening, and I just thought mm. it, it's a conversation that we will trying to continue to have. 
and and we'd love to have you back on at some point. Um, absolutely brilliant. Um, yeah, absolute pleasure. Thank you very much for coming on. And thank uh, you, Steve. Yeah. Thank you, Dan. I really appreciate it. It's been great to have this conversation, and you know, don't have to ask me twice. And I'll, I'll be back in a in a few in a few months. Yep. Let's Brilliant. let's see post post COVID that conversation. Um, that could be <laughs> what it could be twenty forty five too. So let <laughs> let's see when that comes to and see and see what that happens and, and everything else. But yeah, thank you very much and uh, absolute pleasure. Thank yeah, you. Thanks, Liz, thank and you. thanks to everyone for listening and to watching. <laughs>